I have Joan and David Winger here today. So we're doing the rare double. I tried to get them to do it separately. They said, no, we do it together. We, we've known each other since we're 15. We're not going anywhere except together. Is that about right? That's about right. And, and I think we learned together. You know, we evolved together and our interests stayed together. Yeah, so, I get it. Well, my wife know. and I are the same way. You know, it would be, I, I, I could see doing it together as well. She would yeah. be filling in all the blanks that I don't have. And, you know, and I, was like, <laughs> I don't think so. And she'd be like, oh, no, that's that's exactly how it goes. <laughs> that's, a, that's how it goes when you have a long relationship. Right. Completely. That's true. I've that's had true. an amazing ride, which we're going to find out about today, because you both bring something to the table for the Art Dealer Diaries, which is not only your love of art and how you got into it, but on um, Joan's side, buying and selling and collecting on David's side, uh, a collector and a husband that gets to sit in the booth uh, twice a year or more. And then from Navajo textiles from a dating process, which is really interesting and spectra photometry. And I've always been interested in this. And so we'll talk about both those things, but let's just get a little bit of the backstory. Um, I read a little bit, which was nice to fill in some of the things, but I knew you guys have been together forever, but you guys met in, where did you guys grow up together? Philadelphia. It was Philly, right? Well, not yes. West Philly. But no, no, in, 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 well, just in Philadelphia. Yeah. Joe was a little in the suburbs. I was a son of a city fireman in Philadelphia. So your dad was a fireman? Yep. So that's interesting. And what what did uh, what was that like being? I, I don't know if I've known anybody whose father was a fireman. What's that like to have a dad? Because I mean, it's a really dangerous job, especially in a big city. It's kind of be kind of scary as a kid, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I guess I don't remember. You know, he, he was a fireman for 26 years. He, he always said he was a simple man. I grew up in a house with no art and no many books or anything. And, but he always said, if I'm hurt or killed, I'm not a hero. I'm doing my job. That's hmm. the way he, he was a tough cookie. And that's the way he told me right to my face. If anything happens, hmm. that's my job. I chose yeah. it. So he was a very much about, you know, what he, what you saw is what you got with him. Oh, very much so. Very tough character in a, in a way. Uh, yes. He didn't understand, you know, our lives, which we'll get into a little bit, but, uh, yeah, I bet he, well, when you went into what you went into biochemistry and stuff, I'm sure he didn't have a clue. He didn't have a clue. And what did your mom do? She was a saleswoman at Lord & Taylor. Uh, my dad didn't make much money. My mother made a little bit. And it's interesting that Joan's mom worked at Lord & Taylor also. At the same time? Yes. Overlapping, yes. Yeah, but I have, a, I have a very different history from David, though. Okay, well, let's hear that. I want to hear that. Go ahead. Well, my parents are U European. My mom is Czech. My father, Hungarian. And uh, they left Europe in 1939 prior you know, escape. to escape the Nazis. Right. Their family didn't want them to go, and they sensed how, how bad it could be, and they left. But because they did that, they had to start over with nothing. Even though my mother would have been a medical student and my father would have been an architect, but none of those things happened because they had to just get away. How old were they when they came over in 39? Uh, uh, 23 or so, I believe. They were about the same yeah. age. Yeah, young. And their family, you know, didn't want them to go, but they had the courage to go and uh, survived as a result of that. And that was both grandparents that came over, one from Czech and one from where? My from parents, parents, not grandparents. Oh, my grandparents. mother and father, yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did they know each other at that time? Yes, they, they were seeing each other and they uh, quickly got married and, and left uh, oh. at that time. What about their family? What happened to them? Uh, a lot of them didn't survive, but but my, and my mother's parents had already passed, but um, my father's parents did survive and they came over later. Mm. Yeah. But both of my parents grew up in a different environment and appreciated music and art and books. So it was quite different. 
Yeah. So what did they end up doing instead of architecture or medical school? Yeah, my father got involved in the building business, um, architectural products. So he became his own boss in, in his own company. Eventually, that took years, but that's what he did eventually. And my mother didn't really uh, go back to school or whatever, but uh, took a different path. Yeah. And so when you were growing up and you're growing up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, right? Eventually starting in a small house in in the city and then moving eventually to the suburbs. Yeah. Were you interested in art at that time? Yes, I was. I was always interested in art. I went to little classes, you know, uh, when I was younger and, you know, trying to find a way to uh, incorporate it in what I did. So when I went to college, I studied what was it then called design and textiles, fashion design. And I worked in that field for a while. And, and then later worked in ceramics, doing my own pottery. So I always had an interest in textiles and pottery, <laughs> which yes. I'm still doing. Yeah, you do. So when you're going to, when you're in high school, did you, yep. you wanted to become an artist or an interior designer or what did you I, I, I wanted to work with design in kind of what I thought was a more practical way. So that's why it, it ended up being fashion design, which was an interest of mine as well. And your mom but, had worked at Lord and Taylor. So she obviously enjoyed those kind of things to some extent. She did. As well, she right? had a, both of my parents had a sensibility for the arts. Yeah. And so were they cool with you when you said, I'm going into interior design? Uh, fashion design. Yes, fashion very design. much so. Yeah. And that was yeah. Carnegie Mellon. Where did, where did you go? It was, I always say it was Carnegie Tech when I went before they married money. Now it's Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> Carnegie Mellon. And yeah. so, and now you had met David when you were about yes. 15 or 16, somewhere. Yes, in that time. very young. Both of our parents kind of forced us to go to a youth group meeting and that's where we met. Ah, yeah, so that, that was where it was. Yeah. And, and, and we so, dated a little bit, then we broke up then we dated again. And eventually I took her to my high school prom, but then, then <laughs> for about three years, we didn't talk. Yeah. Again. Then we got back. Yeah, whatever. And David, you're a, little, yeah. you're a little older, right? Just a little bit older, David. Uh, one, no, year. One, not one year, one year older. I mean, you look so much look older than Joan. Joan looks so young. It's just, I assumed it had to. <laughs> thank, thank you, I think Mark. The, the interview is over, Mark. Uh, and that was the Art Dealer Diaries today, folks. <laughs> All right, so you guys, but then you got back together. Was that in college? Yes. And David, were you, at, were, you in, were you at Carnegie? Carnegie? Yes. I you was. Were, David yeah. was at Temple in Philadelphia. I was doing pharmacy. I see. So we yeah, let's go back to that because I want to see what your dad had to say when you said, I'm going to go into pharmacy. What it was, was he okay? No, with that? That, no yeah. Well, the, the, this is, you know, when you're a, a fireman and you're, you're not making any money and you realize that we had relatives who were pharmacists and he said, pharmacy, you have a profession. You can own a pharmacy. My brother-in-law, my sister's husband was a pharmacist. My parents' best friend was a pharmacist. Uh, my brother-in-law's father was a pharmacist. So he saw it as a profession, uh, uh, you know, that you could earn a living. And that was his, that's the only thing he could think about being a, growing up in the depression was you have, you have the skills to, and, and as soon as I finished pharmacy or before that, I said, I'm not going to be a pharmacist. I hate this. <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to count and pour for the rest of my life and type a label. And uh, it turned out that I enjoyed biochemistry. And uh, I went to uh, Temple Medical School, was up from the Temple Pharmacy School, Temple University. And I got into the biochemistry department as a PhD student. And did you get um, a master's between that, or did you get a degree in pharmacy? And then right away, I, I had, in fact, I had to take some courses over the summer calculus and things to get into graduate school. But my father didn't understand what a PhD was. He said, well, yeah, you know, what the hell's a PhD? And, uh, <laughs> but it gets worse than that, Mark, because <laughs> when, when I finished my PhD in four years, my dad said, great, you're going to, we got married while I was in graduate school. And uh, my dad said, I guess now you're, you're going to get a job. 
I said, no, now I'm going to do a postdoc. And he said, what the hell's a postdoc? <laughs> he said, well, you go to work with another scientist, see how they do research, learn about new things. And we decided to, to travel and, and live in Israel a year. I was accepted to the Weissman Institute of Science as a postdoctoral fellow. And um, we spent a year there. And then uh, I said, well, we're coming back to the States. And he said, uh, I guess you're going to get a job. I said, no, I'm going to do another postdoc. <laughs> So by this time, he, he was, he was given getting, up on you. He had given up. He said, you know, this is just me. So after two years in San Diego and UCSD, which will bring us a lot into the American Indian collecting and right. people we met, I said, uh, I'm, we're going to move to Denver. And he said, don't tell me another postdoc. I said, no, Pop, I got a job. <laughs> and, you know, he just about <laughs> fell over. You know? <laughs> so, so that was the... Uh, that's how we got to Denver was a sort of a, a route, but my dad never quite got the, yeah. the hang of it. Did he, did he understand how important it was what you had done? I mean, the kind of, cause you had nobody pushing you from the family aspect of, no. this is, you know, what you need to do from a study and education. I mean, just the opposite, right? No, I, I, I can tell you because, you know, I mean, uh, I had a course in, in, uh, during graduate school for my PhD in, in, uh, in genetics, and and it was biochemical phenylketonuria, other diseases where there's a biochemical defect, and I, I it was a light bulb over my head. I was not a good student. I won't go into my bad <laughs> grades and being asked to leave and stuff. But I, I wow, this is how you can combine biochemistry, the fun of doing good biochemistry with human health, and mm. maybe we'll make some some advances that will help help people and help young babies and things. So that one course um, re really was the light bulb mm -hmm. over my head, how to combine biochemistry with, with human health. And that was in a postdoc? No, that was a, as a graduate student uh, a, in graduate. graduate school. And uh, it was a course that we had to take in genetics. It was somebody from St. Christopher's Hospital in Philadelphia gave him, uh, his name was Victor Arbach, a bit of an arrogant son of a gun, but he was smart as a whip. And I enjoyed... Uh, enjoyed it so much that that you know you have to find something you love mm -hmm. and i did and genetics was still pretty early then oh, very early, early. And very you're, early. Talking, yeah. you're talking this was in the this is 60 64 5 6 7 8 yeah, it was very yeah. early and watson and crick are what year are they 59 maybe something yeah yes yeah. so yeah but they i mean they knew the you know what dna was but no genes had been cloned there was no methods for cloning genes right. and and, uh, and yeah. you know, of course, PCR came much later and all these advances in, 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 in you know, expanding, uh, amplifying DNA. So it was, um, yeah. but, but the, the basis was there mm -hmm. uh, for PKU and Bob Guthrie and Guthrie tests for babies. And it was, a, it, was um, it, it was an exciting beginning. When I think back, I was a lipid chemist. I was working on disorders of lipid metabolism. But, right. And, and uh, when I did a postdoc, I was in the lab that found the cause of Tay-Sachs disease. When That's it happened. That was your specialty, right? Tay-Sachs disease? Well, I, 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 one of them. It's not really what I worked on because there was too many people working in that field. It was, uh, you could buy a synthetic substrate and measure the enzyme. And I said, hell with that. I'm going to do something that's a little more difficult. And, uh, but uh, it was, I was at the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. Did you recognize that genetics was kind of going to blow up? I mean, just like tech blew up in 94, you know, blockchains blowing up now, did you see genetics as going, okay, this is the future. This is where this is headed. I, I, mean, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say I was that intuitive. <laughs> I would say I was enjoying myself. <laughs> uh, I was enjoying what I was doing. We were making slow advances in, in, in metabolism and pathways. And we still hadn't cloned any of the genes. We knew what caused Tay-Sachs disease. And what what's, to me is very interesting uh, as a biochemist was in those days to diagnose a disease I work on a lot, crab A disease or Tay-Sachs, you needed to do brain biopsies. Mm. By the time we got to biochemical defects and you could just take blood and measure a missing enzyme, that changed yeah. everything. You know, because instead of a brain biopsy to make a diagnosis, you yeah. could take two mils of blood and, yeah. and say, hey, the kid doesn't have this enzyme. Yeah. That, that was important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, for the patient and for everyone. Oh, yes. for sure. The families yeah. could stop the surge. The doctors could get a quick diagnosis. Yes. Yeah, and you take the pain away of unknowing. Unknowing is such a oh, I know. That's thing right. You know, for that. parents. Yeah, that absolutely. We'd rather know what it is, even yeah. if it's said, a bad diagnosis. said the same thing many times. Yeah, when when, when yeah. people say, David, why are you so happy when you make a diagnosis? And I said, you know, I didn't give the child the disease. And now the parents can stop searching. They can meet other families whose right. kids yeah. have that disease. They can meet foundations where they can yeah. support them, you know. Right. Right. So that's, yeah. I used to tell my patients if I there was a, something that they had, I couldn't figure it out. I would say, well... I don't know what it is, but the good news is at least I can tell you what it isn't. And then yeah. I would give them a list of these are not what it is. So, but we have to get you somewhere to someone else who can figure out what it is. So at least some of the things go off the table. Sure. So you guys are in, so you get your PhD in about 64? No, no, my BS in 64, my PhD in 68, 68. started living in Denver. So. First. We went in 69 to 71. We lived in San Diego. And I have to say that was part of our meeting these people who were in the beginning of the Indian art. Okay. Uh, Hubert Guy started the Indian trader. Ron Munn was there. There was a collector, Carl Harkel Road. There was Ron Mylan's auctions we started going to. And you know, right. we, we were for we were introduced to Native American arts, which we had never been aware of growing up on the East Coast. No. No sense of it at all. Until yeah, well, it was kind of blowing up at that time. I mean, that's when it really kind of started, right? Is that late 60s time frame. Right. Yeah. So you're there in 69 in San Diego. Yeah. Is that right? So you let mean, me give you one. one uh, we drove after coming back from Europe, Israel. It, we drove across the country and we bought our first piece of Native American art in a luncheonette in Page, Arizona. We bought a frog woman, a little canteen by Joyce Navazi. Yeah. Join the buzzy. And, and and that was our first piece, and that was October of 1969. You still have we, it? No. <laughs> what? No. We John don't. sold no. it. John sold it off immediately. <laughs> so how long did you keep that, Joan? Before you did something with it, do you remember? Quite long. We kept it. Oh a long yeah, time. I forget. Yeah, I don't remember how long. Yeah, it was not. It was four dollars. I can remember <laughs> that's what we paid for. It. Not four dollars now. <laughs> But yeah. we do remember going to some auctions uh, when we were in uh, La Jolla and uh, seeing Apache baskets selling for fifty dollars. Straw yeah. baskets and German towns for a hundred. And I mean, we were students basically, you know. Just, I mean, yeah. that was we were shocked. <laughs> and when did you go to your first show, Indian show? And what was it? What show was it? Do you remember? Go, you mean visiting a show or yeah, just visiting? Yeah, visiting. Just visiting. Maybe LA. In 1970, we, were in, yeah. we heard about the LA tribal show yeah. in 1970. And we drove up, I yeah. remember, to, right. um, to LA to that show, which was a mixture of, of pre Columbian. In fact, we bought a pre Columbian jar. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that was probably, other than Ron Milan's auctions, they were probably the first time we went to a show. Until they started having them in Denver. Yeah. Sharon Good and other people started having the early 70s. And who were some of the players that were at that first show that are do you remember? Were people like Michael Haskell and things yeah. there? Mike, Michael Haskell. Yeah, I, I don't remember in LA so much. It was a huge, yeah. a very big show. Yeah, I don't either. And, I think uh, we were at the beginning. And, I, don't think and I tell you, we in in 1966, backtracking a second was that the year we got married, we didn't really have a honeymoon. It was January, we were between, I was between semesters and graduate school. We went to, in June, we went to Columbia, South America, to a friend who was a Ford Foundation fellowship from MIT who was working in Manizales. So when people say, come visit, we don't do it to us twice because we're, we're, <laughs> we're on our way. So we went to Columbia, South America and visited him and we bought a couple of pre-Columbian pieces of pottery and a little bit of jewelry but no, we um no we textiles up, what no textiles joan no no, no textiles at no, that no, time. No, no, yeah. no textile but we, you know we didn't have much money and they were cheap but we started thinking about collecting Ameri uh, uh pre-columbian mexican and we had some yeah. south america but the fakes got better than my ability to detect fakes yeah 
And then we thought, hey, there's American Indian art. Maybe maybe we can learn that in the beginning and start collecting that. That's sort of where the a lot of it started. Yeah, and then we went to museums and we met people. You know, it we started to study it more and learn more. And at this point, Joan, did you think, well, this is something I might enjoy doing as an avocation, buying and selling, or was it? Well, yes, although in the beginning, I actually, I started to do shows in Denver because we had a young daughter and it, I, could, I could be flexible with that kind of a business. But I, I dealt much more in Americana and folk art a little bit in Native American as I was learning about it. So mm-hmm. I would I would go east to visit family, go to shows, buy things and bring them back to Colorado. So initially it was a lot more Americana and folk art, just a little Native American. Mm-hmm. And uh, eventually the balance changed, you know, but that took time. And so when you're going through this process living in Denver, that's also the Vietnam War is going on. Be, and you were able to not have to do that, David, because you were married and had a child? No, and by, by 1968, I was 26, and I had gotten a deferment through graduate school. Right. Mm. And, you know, I wasn't like an MD who had to serve their, you know, their, go in. By the time I was 26, when we actually we left the country a few days before I was 26 in, in, mm-hmm. in May of, of, of 68, mm-hmm. and... Um, I just never, I, 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 it's an interesting story. I grew up being in, a son of a fireman. We lived in a low middle class neighborhood and a lot of the kids could not wait to join the army. The mm-hmm. sons of the firemen next door, the policemen, the factory workers. And when I went to the draft board about showing them my letters that I'm in good standing, they said, don't worry. We have more people to fill our quotas than any, any neighborhood because the kids that's, mm. you know, I was one of the few kids to go to college and growing up there. So I, she said, don't worry. So I, I didn't, really lucked out. Yeah, I didn't realize that they actually had quotas from neighborhoods. Yes, they did. I, there were friends in graduate school who got yanked out of school. They come from high class neighborhoods that couldn't meet their quotas. They were in good standing and they were yanked out of graduate they were drafted. school. Drafted. Yeah, that was a very difficult time. That was a difficult time to be in America. I don't, I don't think people realize how difficult it was. Well, it was, you know, we, I, just to backtrack one second, in 1968, which I consider one of the worst years of the country with Martin Luther King, we were, that's the year I got my PhD. We went to Europe for four months. We were in Paris during the student riots in Paris. We were in Czechoslovakia when the Russians invaded. We were, um, uh, it, 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 oh, we were in Italy at the time. We came back from the beach and said, oh, what a shame about Kennedy. It was the day that Robert Kennedy was shot June 5th of 68. So yeah. there are a lot of bad things in, yeah. in that in, in that time. Right. Yeah, and the Democratic National Convention, Convention in Chicago was a bloodbath. That's right. Yes. Yeah, That's it was right. bad. So anyway, we're, we're jumping around a little yeah. bit, but this no. is our life. <laughs> I mean, it all this puts it in context of where you are and what's going on. I mean, you're starting your life basically, right? Right. I mean, yeah. you got That's... your PhD, you're married, you know. Right. And, you know, the world looks like it's falling yeah. apart. I think right. there's some correlation to what we see today. And we, you know, yes. we feel like things are so bad. Sometimes they are actually. Yes. But, um, you know, there are there were other times that were not so great. And Nixon gets impeached in whatever, 74, probably. So, I mean, this this there are some trends you can see there. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, it was mm-hmm. it was, uh, you know, we had a wonderful we, we drove. We spent four months in Europe getting to Israel, 11,000 miles to the mile we drove before we got on a ferry to Israel and in, in Greece. So it was quite an experience. And in those days, Europe on $5 a day, probably we didn't spend $10 for the two of us, including housing, food, and gas. And uh, Were you looking at art at that time? Were you going to museums? Yes, yes. we were. I'm buying art, too. Well, oh. a little I mean, bit. Yeah, a little. We had great experiences. I mean, they were tough. Yeah. We saw plenty of, you know, we'd go to Foundation Mech and you'd see sculpture, oh, yeah. we, all the galleries in Paris. And we bought two pieces of art in Yugoslavia, in Dubrovnik, before we, uh, <laughs> while we were traveling and we still have them. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you're in Denver, 
you're buying and selling, Joan, in folk yes. art, primarily a little Native American. Yes. David, you're working, um, doing genetic yep. research, yep. basically. And is that where you met Joe Ben Wheat? Well, Joe Ben Wheat, it, so we're in the early 70s. We start to meet some of the, the community, uh, Joyce Harrell from, we used to have a meeting once every month or two where people have show and tell of Indian art. And Joyce Harrell was there, David Irving, Mike Kastner, who repaired things. Uh, Paul Harbaugh, a bunch of people who, who had an interest in Native American art. And, and certainly uh, we had heard about Joe Ben Wheat and we had a few Indian rugs. I mean, I really mean rugs. Yeah. And he would say, you know, can we come up and show you? He said, sure. And he said, well, that, that, you know, that's fine, uh, but let me show you something better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and at that point, and we're talking mid late 70s, 77, 78. And he, we knew he was writing the book the b book yeah and he said the only thing missing is dye analysis and and uh it's not that it you know sometimes don't 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 equate dye analysis with dating it really doesn't date it, it it tells you what the dye is and then you look at the style the feel the everything else that goes into a, a textile other than just red dye right. um and he um i said well maybe i can help you now max saltzman had worked out a method of, of analyzing red for both pre-Columbian and some American India, but he needed four inches of weft. Yeah, nice. So I don't know anybody, or especially museum curators or keeper of collections, who are going to say, "Sure, that classic Serapi or that Pancha, you can have four inches of weft. Yeah. They'd rather kill you." <laughs> and, uh, so I said, "Well, maybe I, I have a spectrophotometer. I can use the. I mean, it's his method. Except that I said maybe I could get by with an eighth of an inch." Right. And um, so, so Joe was very, very uh, nice to us. He was very, very sharing in his knowledge. He, um, I said I could help him. Um, and um, so that's how it started. So mm -hmm. my first samples from him were 1981, mm. when he wanted to have samples of uh, uh, text that, doc that had documented collection right. history. Not that that was when they were made, but at least if it was 1870, it was... Collected it, it wasn't older than that. Mm -hmm. So I started doing about 400, between three and 400, I forget exactly the number of samples that had that had um, collection histories from all the great museums, of, whether it was Lowe or SAR or School of American Research or Peabody or mm -hmm. Smithsonian. Or I started, he would collect the sample. He would write to the curators or take them himself. Some I took at SAR and places like that. And um, started doing it for him. And uh, that was that the was, beginning. That was the beginning. Then then collectors and other people, Dealers. including you, I, I've just been going through, unfortunately, I'm going through 41 years, 40 years of dye tests and throwing most of them away because there's no information. No, I know, I know, I don't, don't, don't say that, Mark. <laughs> if, 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 if all I get was a sample and no description and we it's coaching the We just right. don't, but we just don't know what that might important thing. i understand that but i won't know what it is anyway but i all so i wrote to just recently wrote to boulder and yeah. i asked you i wrote to, i wrote dan headland saying where do you think joe's those important early samples from 81 to that came from joe with, with his his note to me my note right. to him his note back to the museum so i am sure i am getting them together to donate to boulder there you to, go to his museum yeah so so um you know, that was, uh, he, he, I can remember one because Joe was a wonderful man. He, one day he said, can I come down and watch you do it? Instead of sending me 20, 30 samples. He, so he came down for the day to, to my lab and he was like a kid in a candy store. You know, he's just watching me. And as this, as the peaks start, to, the spectrum phenomenon starts to um, make, make the peaks, you know, I can, I know what it's going to be. I mean, I can tell by the start of these, I just coach an eel I said, come on, Joe, make a guess. What's this next one? You know, so we had a, a game. Then we went back to a lunch at our house afterward. But um, he, he was very generous with his knowledge. And I uh, yeah. was happy that I could help him. Yeah. Tell me a little bit and our audience a little bit about Joe Ben Wheat. So for those people who do not know who this man is. Well, you know, he he looked like Indiana Jones with his vest and his pipe and his hat and his he, he would work in the summers out in Yellow Jacket, an archaeological dig, I guess, in eastern Utah. 
I never got there. We used to say, come on down to visit us. Uh, we never did. He, he, was, he was a quiet man, I would say, and he was just a kind man. He, he, he loved to talk about textiles and, and would show you and get out the magnifying glass and show you what raveled yarn was, which we didn't know at that time, and, 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 and commercial ply yarn. And uh, he, he, was a, um, he, was a, he was a real uh, you know, academic yeah. um, that's the word. archaeologist, anthropologist, mm -hmm. uh, ethnologist. You know, he, he had lots of, um, I think he liked to get out in the field and get a little dirty out there in Yellow Jacket uh, in the summers. And, but he, he and was a teacher. He, and a good teacher. He, he, he was, I'm glad it was a wonderful opportunity for us yeah. to meet him. Right. And he was a PhD, right? Yes. Yes. And, and I, 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 assume, I, I, I think so. Yeah. Yes. And so his claim to fame is, well, one, he did this, this Jobin Wheat book, which is, you know, a, a descriptive book of Navajo textiles that's considered to be one of the great pieces of information for those people who want to buy it and, and own it. And you, I think it's still in print so you can get it. Um, but he really brought to forefront dating system for early Serapes, Navajo blankets, right? Wouldn't you say that's true to some extent? I don't know whether dating, I, I think he was more very interested. I mean, he would show me manifestos from the U.S. Army of delivering bolts of, of, of Valletta or up from Mexico. I think his documentation was was amazing. You know, he could find out, out old manifestos from at Bosque Redondo that they were getting what colors and what he, he, he did that amazingly well. I think that what was interesting to me was when he was getting samples to me from things like Massacre Cave Fragments. So it was right. 1804, yes. at the latest. And, and I was seeing what dyes I was seeing. So it showed me some of the, 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 some of the women's dresses, the fragments had pure cochineal. Some had pure lac. Some had mixture. So and when people say, well, we tend to think of lac dye as being earlier in Serapes, and it does tend to be more 1850, you know, pre-1850, 60. He, um, they were there, you know, the, the spectral photometer doesn't lie. And, um, and uh, so I think that he, I don't know whether he, if I have to be a little critical, and I, I, I love Joe, was that in his book, I, I would wish I wish, and I've talked to Ann Hedlund, I want 75 of those textiles retested. Or they or they or, many or were tested, right. many were not tested. He had an interesting symbol where it was in parentheses, it was tested. Sometimes he'd write not tested, sometimes he'd write something else. But there were so many that had nothing. So I don't know whether it was tested, it was not tested, or it's a guess. And I would like the yellow stickums in my version of that book says it, it should and be I've talked today. to Anne it, it, this we should get back into these textiles and, and resample them or redate them I think I mean that's I'm being a little critical but Joe you know it became an obsession with him to get to do this and he did a great job and I love looking at that book I look at it all the time and uh, I was looking at it the other night on a on a dress panels that we just acquired because I was looking at the weft count, the warp count it was all there. Mm. Amazing. And but so I, when, I, yeah, I was going to say, when you're handling a fragment from Massacre Cave in 1804, which is this tragic event that happened in Canyon de Chelly and with the, you know, a lot of people passing, you know, and not being touched for so long, that had to be almost... <clears throat> to me, it seemed like it would almost be religious to be touching something like that. I know you're doing it for science and it's just a, it's a piece of wool, but did you feel that sense when you were doing it? No, you know, a lot of them I did not collect. I mean, I would, yeah. Joe had the people where somewhere at the Smithsonian, Mark Winter owned a bunch of them, uh, the Durango collection. I mean, they were, they were scattered around uh in different places so no i understand that but the, the actually when you're handling the the yarn to do the spectrophotometry no I, I can't say i did i i i understood you know that it was it was a bad event and uh but i i didn't um, get emotional about hmm. you know this little eighth of an inch piece of fabric they sent me from the smithsonian I, 
Uh, you, maybe I'm not an emotional guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, your dad was a firefighter and said, yeah, yeah. if I die, I did my job. Don't think I'm <laughs> a hero. Don't so, worry about it. You know, that's right. I mean, that stuff sticks, right? I mean, that's yeah. still in there. You know? no, I think that, you know, I, I, I understood what I, that it was important information because mm -hmm. people were saying, oh, they didn't use Coach O'Neill back in 1804. I'm sorry they did. Yeah. <laughs> Here's yeah, the that, proof. And what did Joe think about that when you found that out? Because that had to be fairly, uh, you know, a Rosetta Stone almost. Yeah, I, I don't know whether he was surprised or not. I mean, he was, um, I think he took information as information. I, I don't think he, um, you know, we all knew later we were looking at ponchos and serapes and earlier, most of those had lac dye or mixtures. And um, I don't, I don't know whether he was surprised or not. He didn't say, well, I'm shocked. That it's Coach Anil at, mm. at that at that age. He, he never told me that. He could have been <laughs> a little bit surprised. And so, what what really are the dyes that you can test for? Coach Anil, lac and indigo. And do you, are there any other ones? Well, if if the green if a green dye is has indigo, I can't do yellows. But if I see a, a nice green sample and it's and the spectra says indigo, then mm. it then it's it's yellow and it's rabbit brush or something plus. Indigo. I can no. I can tell rabunium the matter mm. because I was getting samples some sometimes from Billy Siegel or Steve Berger of, of uh, Bolivian or Peruvian textiles, and I would see um, rabunium is a is a pre-Columbian. It's like matter. It's yeah. basically the same. It's similar, and um, you know I would see textiles from South America in that area that had both cochineal and rabunium in the same textile, different shades of red. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I lost, I mean, I'm not that interested in synthetic dyes because they had a long shelf life. Once they got some good synthetic dyes, they, 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 they don't help with dating because they were used for 30 years. They were used from the early 1880s, late 70s, up until into the 1900s. I can see the same dye. So it doesn't um, tell me much. And I, I guess I don't care about them <laughs> too much. Yeah, because it doesn't give you enough information. It's the scientist in you. You want I mean, to get granular. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, obviously, when a, when a, a collector or a dealer and you you say it's synthetic dye, it, it is what it is. It it doesn't um, it doesn't really change anything if it's one synthetic dye or or another. Yeah. They, they 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 making a good red dye was a very critical factor in in dye industry. I mean, red was. That's why the, the, the Dutch, if they captured a Spanish ship, bringing back cochineal was better than finding gold. Yeah, it was, well, it was worth more, for sure, by the Worth by more, the right. Yeah, for sure. Until, yeah. until Perkins invented his coal par synthetic dyes in, what, 1859? Yeah, but, but that's not what you use the Navajo. We don't see them, period. Yeah. I, I always tell people, and Ponso 2R was the really first good synthetic red that wasn't patented until 1879. Yeah. So as much as people like to push their dates back to 75, 70, whatever, I think that when I see that dye, it's, it's 1880. And it's the same in Oriental carpets. I read all these books on dye testing in Oriental carpets. And I'll tell you, it's a lot easier to go from Germany to the Middle East than from Germany to Four Corners. Yeah. And, um, and, and if they date these all 1880 and above, because of that dye, to me, it seems like that's, you know, people don't want to hear it sometimes. But yeah, I was going to ask you that question. Do you ever get a dealer or a collector got angry with you and saying, I don't believe what you sent me or what you told me? Well, go ahead. I was yeah, going to yeah. say only when they send you the wrong sample. They send me a repair. Yes. Yes. Or a tassel. <laughs> no. Right. 90% of tassels are replaced. When I, give, <laughs> when I give my dye talk, I have one of these symbols of. Yeah red with a line through it thing, no tassels, no yeah. edge cores, no selvage. A lot of it's been replaced. And um, yes. so uh, yeah, I've had people, in yeah, fact, the University shocked. Museum has a beautiful poncho that is just beautiful in, in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And the, Joan's dad was helping out there for a while. And, uh, and he, they sent me a sample and it comes back synthetic. I said, you know, no freaking way. Is that <laughs> synthetic? Well, they took a uh, it's easy to take a little snip of the tassel. Yeah. Then they took the, the body of it. It was lack. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and I remember Charles Everly, another collector, of, he sent yeah. me an Akama Manta and he sent it to me. I said, uh, Charles, it's synthetic. And, and he said, what? He said, this is supposed to be 1860, 18, whatever. And, uh, and then he said, I said, where did you take it again? It's back to the corner of Tassel. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah so, so I've had, you yeah. know, if someone sends me one sample and it's not what they think, it could be where they took it. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, Mark, there are people now buying things they bought from dealers who they say, I, I just want to confirm what I was told 20 years ago. Yeah. Or I, that, that, that you did it 20 years ago. Fine. Uh, if Because they um, just want to be sure. Yeah. But I've never had to reverse anything, tell you the truth. Yeah. <laughs> and have you done anything with electron micro microscopy on? Uh, no. Uh, no, no, I, no, not. I, I, I have a, a philosophy of keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. And that's my <laughs> that's the way I do my research, even though I clone genes and put it in viral vectors and, and cure animals. But I I um, in terms of dye testing, I have kept it the simplest equipment that I that the money can buy. Um, no, I remember I, 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 I did a uh, ad um, in Native American art magazine in like maybe the early 90s. And I did spectra or uh, electron microscopy on some classic blankets and did an ad with it because uh, mm. my father had a uh, electron microscope. Oh, a and uh, I got real blowback. People were like, what is this? What are you doing this for? This doesn't matter. I'm like, well, it does, though. It may. Well, but that's looking at the fibers, you know. Yeah, I, know. Uh, yeah, I, know. I mean, as opposed to dyes, you know, yes. the, 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 right. the dyes. But um, they even did a study. I don't know if you know Smith is a collector of New York, but he bought some fancy equipment for the Metropolitan. And we had, a, there was a question about, if I see Stroud cloth, or a raveled yarn that's a mixture of lac 70, 30% cochineal, was, did, did they mix separate fibers to get that combination? They took some that was lac dyed. Well, right. I, I wrote back, I said, that's absolute baloney. No, you know, and the, one of the people up there said, no, they, they use different mordants. You can't dye lac and cochineal. Well, that's, that's all crazy. So they ended up doing a, I did a study with them where I had, they came from Dick Port. So his father had all these pieces of Stroud. And uh, so I took like eight samples in different areas of the Stroud. It came up with the same ratio. It was always 70, 30. So they, at, 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 at the, using atomic absorption, they could take one hair, one hair, not a little bundle. Yeah. And, and they went through and, and did the analysis and it came out 70, 30. So it's, it was dyed as that, that one. Yeah. It was dyed yeah. that way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes sense too, right? I mean, it does. yeah, sure. It does. The Especially idea of see it over and over again, right? It was it was the family recipe that looked good, right? You know? or, or but said no, it wasn't even the family since this this wool was wool. I mean, was dyed in Europe. No, or I in know Mexico. So yeah. it was yeah, it, yeah. It, was, it, right. it was it was it the ratio seventy thirty. People ask me, is it because they like the color? Is cochineal a little more color fast than lac? Is it the the what availability? They were getting lac from India. So here's mm -hmm. England. They're getting lac from India, cochineal from Canary Islands once they started uh, growing it there. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you know, it, it, it seems to be um, that they mix them for whatever ratio, whatever reason, color, fastness, availability, that we see every ratio from 70, 30, 30, 70, 10 to 9, you know, 10, 90, whatever. It's been yeah, so it was done at that time. Yes, it was done when it was after it was was it was dyed in the bolt. Yeah. yeah. All right. Now let's flip over to Joan. Your your turn to be on the hot seat, Joan. <laughs> <laughs> David could get off. So you <laughs> so when you moved back to Philadelphia from Denver, that's when you really started getting into Native American material, right? Yes. There yes. wasn't any dealers there, and you saw an opportunity. Yes, I did. There were many people, many of us competing for the quilts and the folk art and whatever, some very, very well-known dealers. So I thought this would be a little more unique. So yeah, that's when I focused more on Native American. I still well, did some of the other, but. Yeah, and what year was that? 
Well, we moved in 86 and I was doing some of the big shows, the York show in Pennsylvania and mm -hmm. some in New York and I'm uh, already in Bucks Bennett. County. Santa Fe too, Don Bell and Bennett show. Oh yeah, and Don Bennett's show I start I did also. Yeah. So that's when the focus changed. And your area of interest continued to be ceramics and textiles, right? Pueblo Mainly. pottery and yeah, and, and some uh, and jewelry. Right. I gotten into quite a bit as well. Well, and now you course, are. When did you get into that, by the way? Yeah, I mean, I always associate you with great jewelry. I mean, that's what you're known for. It, One of the it just grew, but I uh, I was in more, it started more in Pennsylvania, actually, because I had a friend who was very interested in it, Mim Line, and her husband. And I started, you know, paying attention to it. And that's when I began, basically, yeah. In that time frame in the 86, right? Yeah, around. late 80s. I, I right away was doing shows back east and uh, yeah, seeking it out. And so do you remember making any uh, great finds or great mistakes? Or both? Um, not so much. We all much. do, by the way. We all yeah, make Yeah, we yeah. all do. We all do. Not make buying enough and know. some things you, we always say, some things you buy very well and others you really pay for and you hope it all balances out in the end. But okay. um, yeah, one of the great finds was the Eastern, the Seminole bag that I found at a little jewelry, show yeah. um, outside of Harrisburg, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, that was really an, a wonderful early. Like 1820s piece. kind of thing. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And it ended up in the Manugian collection oh, yeah. via Ellen. uh, Eleanor Taubman. So oh, that was, that was a great experience. <laughs> yeah, well, those keep you going back. They do. You're oh, right. Yeah, it was beautiful. And then they borrowed it at the wheelwright when they did oh, yeah. uh, like a masterpiece show. It was a number of years ago. Yeah, right. Yeah, those things are so rare and hard to identify. Um, I had something like that that a lady brought in and she wanted to consign it for five hundred dollars, and I said, "I don't think that's right. I think it's really early." <laughs> right. And we ended up getting her—I don't know, five or seven thousand dollars instead. And she was just blown away, as was I, actually, um, <laughs> because it wasn't very big and small. Yeah. But I could tell it was an early thing, you know. Yeah. Well, this one went for a lot more. But the funny part is, is Joe yeah. was was with this woman who knows jewelry very well. They went out to this Harrisburg little show, and Joan got the bag. And, and the woman said, well, how much did you pay for him? And she said, I paid $400. And the other woman, who's quite knowledgeable in Jewish, said, boy, they knew what they had. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. it, it, it wasn't close, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but it was funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever share with that woman what it ultimately went for? Uh, so they knew what I'm they had. Sure that I did. <laughs> yeah. Might be getting Joan a call. doesn't write. I'll tell you one thing about Joan. She likes to keep it very... Under the radar. Under the radar. <laughs> and so that was a great find. What about something that turned out not so much that you would have thought it would have been any of those? Not, not at that level. Yeah, not at that level. No, we've at overpaid all. for a few things. Oh, sure. <laughs> there was one textile, a pictorial one that turned out to be Turkish, which, yeah, you know, yeah. you learn what they're doing. Yeah. It was too good to be true. And then you find the, the original in a book, you know, that they copied. Basically. Right. So that was a lesson. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't that expensive. No, all. but that's how we learn. <laughs> no, it is, it, is, it is how you learn. <laughs> We've all done that one. And one we all time. take risks. And that's part of it, too. You know. Right. So how do you see this this business have changed so much? I mean, you really have been in it from the beginning, yes. pretty much. Yes. So and it, to now, I mean. Yeah, and, and, and you know how how hot things were, pottery included a number of years ago, and then and Germantowns, how how things fluctuate. Um, it's part of the marketplace and it is a changing marketplace and where it's going, we have a lot of discussions about that. What's ahead? I mean, we love it, we love learning. We, you know, you're always learning, which is one of the great things about it. But um, will there be many new young collectors? There are some, but um, I don't know. It's a different era. Well, you just did Indian, the Indian shows here in yeah. Santa Fe. And did you have any young clients come through or youngish? 
Not a lot. Yeah. I'm trying to you think. Know, I, I, and I do a lot with dealers. dealers. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. And there's not as many young dealers. There's a few. No, but, a few. Yeah. yeah, there are a few. Yeah. Right. And we're happy to see yeah. Jamie Compton and Brandt and uh, some of the come along. Yeah. And, and of course, you know how much is done online now. And that's just something I don't enjoy. I mean, I'm a hands on yes. meet people, get out there. It's all part of it for me. Yes. Um, so I resist it, which might not be smart, but it's what I enjoy. Yeah. And how do you find material? <laughs> it's harder and harder. Yeah, it it's is. Hard. Right? I go. I still go out and whatever. Although the last year and a half, there was nothing to go to because everything was shut down. So, yeah. it's, you know, when you look back when the days she used to go out to oh, the main yeah. line and she would go to the thrift stores or the yeah. consignment shops and she'd come back with the German tan and moccasins and pipes and yeah, years same. nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so it is. I think being in Philadelphia was also a, uh, a real advantage in that time frame, too, because there wasn't as many Native American dealers in the East Coast, especially right. in the area. So right. you could go and pick an antique could, show or a, or a local show or Brimfield or something like that and, yeah. and have probably could get a lot, actually. We never did a lot in that way. I mean, I, yeah, but I, I still think we bought more from dealers even good dealers, how can you buy from them? Yeah, you never know you where never something. Know. And I, and I in, in the textiles I deal with, I, I don't want a huge inventory of rugs, you know, which is fine if you're in the West, whatever. But um, I look for graphic art. I look at it more as an art piece. And uh, so it's what I seek out, which, which is difficult, actually. It doesn't yeah. come up that frequently. Yeah, I actually have always thought we kind of had similar tastes. And what yes. Do. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you bought that what pot thing? this summer. That was the only thing I really looked at and go, oh, oh. that's a great hope if I should buy that. And next time, and then I see it in your house, it's like, okay. <laughs> that, that was to, That totally makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, and that was like modern art to me. It was. It is modern art. I was going to keep it, actually. The it was Hopi Bowl. Oh, the the Hopi Bowl art. that was very, yeah. very minimal. Yeah. yeah, just a beautiful object, you know, just yeah. it was just graphic and sung. Right. Yeah, had that yeah. thing. Hopi is our main interest of collecting. Yeah, well, we do love Hopi and we love Nampeo work. Yeah. But yeah. not exclusively that. Yeah. I like Palaka. Yeah. But related to Hopi, I can tell you an interesting story about Jimmy Coots. Yeah. Jimmy Kuchungsi, who uh, we knew him, got to meet him through Eckhart Maloki, who was uh, an Anglo German who speaks Hopi and wrote some books and there's gets us some controversy about whether all of his information should have been out, but he used to go to third Mace at a hotel villa and um, he knew Jimmy very well. And he said, so we were out traveling around the Southwest and going to pawn shops and stuff. And we went to see Jimmy and um, we had an, in fact, the same day, I think we went to see Charles Lolomo the next day. So we, we had an interesting day on, in, in, uh, in, in Third Mesa, and um, it turned out that uh, a couple of years later, Jimmy, um, he had been in the Second World War and mm -hmm. knew that there were masks in Berlin that were Hopi masks that needed to be fed. So people contacted us and said, we're going to pass Jimmy from Phoenix to you, and from you, you'll send him to New York uh, on the plane, and then he'll go to Germany. So he came he picked Denver. him up at the Denver airport mm -hmm. and he had a, a bag of sacred cornmeal mm -hmm. and he had a, a big double track, what used to be recording of, you know, um, Songs. what do they call them? Jets? You know, chance. No, no, but I mean the, the, the big, big ones, this big to, to do a tape. Yes. And he said, now he came to our house. We were putting him up for the night. I said, he said, you want to listen to chance? So here we are with Jimmy at our house with the cornmeal, him playing his chance that he was going to play to the mass to, to keep them alive. Yeah, that's amazing. So that was quite an experience. Yeah, and, I mean, he's uh, a great a great carver for those who might not know who Yeah, gave we, he gave us a two, a two, a little, two carving, little one. Yeah, which we and, still have. Yeah. And then another interesting experience is we love Raymond Sequaptua. And Joan has a bracelet on here that <laughs> from, from, <laughs> that's a from Raymond. 
And uh, it turns out that we, we were talking to Raymond, who used to try to beat uh, Rob Lucas from the wheelwright to, to Raymond at Indian Market to get Raymond's things. Well, Ray, we actually got to talk to Raymond and got to know Jimmy Coots was his uncle. Mm. And he said, oh, you were part of the people that passed him along to, to get to uh, back to Germany to, to feed the, the mass. Did you ever get to talk to him about what that was like when he went to Germany and did that? No, not yeah. afterward. No, we didn't see him after that. We, we had yeah. a great day with him. I remember him sitting in his uh, uh, um, uh, dirt, hard dirt floor in his home on Hode Villa. And, he had, I guess his daughter had a baby and he would reach oh. over with his foot and kick it to make it swing. He would make the cradle, not make the, the cradle. I mean, the cradle. <laughs> <laughs> and he, we were talking and he would just give it a keep kick it and keep him swinging. quiet. But uh, I mean, the, that old, I mean, all, all these, this is back in the early 80s. I mean, Did you buy anything from Alolama when you went to his? No, he couldn't. Unfortunately, yeah. It was really expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Even then, Even you know, then, relative to. So this would have been in the, yeah, the it was late early, 80s, I guess. Yeah. But, um, that was earlier. Earlier than that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was. That's right. Uh, what was oh, that's right. Right. Do you remember Loloma and what he was like? No, I remember him being very generous with his time. He had a, a very lovely blonde woman. I don't know whether that time was, he always had blondes, I heard. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was um, very, very generous with his time. And we watched him work a little bit, but we, we couldn't afford a yeah. bracelet. Or, yeah. We have yeah. one now, but... Yeah. <laughs> Well, he was a masterpiece. I mean, he was a master silversmith. Yes. One of the yes. greats. And uh, yeah, it was expensive. I mean, I remember going to Anita Day's studio and, you know, and probably it would have been 1990 or 89. And I, all these great Popovi Day pots mm -hmm. and, and I couldn't afford them. I mean, it's like, there's no way I can afford these. I, I wanted them, but no <laughs> yeah. I've had no some way. of them since. I've I'm had, sure you uh, have. Yeah. <laughs> Not at that time. Mm -hmm. No, but you know, but I, I always look back at that experience with with Jimmy Puchungsia in our house, playing chance and yeah. showing mm -hmm. us the corn he was going to feed them with along the show. Yeah. So I wish I had talked to him afterward, but uh, he, I mean, he's he's been gone for quite a while now. Well, I think that's the thing you take away. I mean, these are real things. These are not these are not things to be sold or to. Not, not, I mean, they belong to the people. Things like right. the Hopi masks are very sacred, and they are. They're living objects. I yeah. saw I saw one in London a few years ago in somebody's house thing, and I was like, mm, "You shouldn't have that." I said, "That's a living right. god." He said, "You need to, you need to consider giving that back. That's not something that should be owned." Well, right. we were in Paris with that big auction, the big auction of Hopi masks. We were there. Yeah. We, I was we there for work. To be I was there, there for yeah. work, and uh, we went. It was quite a ruckus evening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think people are waking up. Not only just the public, yeah. but others that there are certain things. I mean, that have spiritual, religious, um, right, meaning, and they shouldn't. They're not things to be bought or sold. What we deal in and what we're careful about are things that really are, relate to the more of the. Uh, 1870 to you know 40s time frame that were often really made for tourist trade right. they're early uh they could be self-use but they're usually those would be things more like moccasins or maybe some blankets and things and even the blankets that the navajos made even early on were all made for trade these are things were made for yeah. trade mm -hmm. at that time these were not not religious objects or used right. religious ceremonies ever they were things for you know they were made because they were very valuable they could trade for horses or money mm -hmm. yeah, or, mm -hmm. or use or self-use sure no no um i'm just thinking of um, things pop into my head in the early days we went to denver in 1971 we moved there but in may 71 we went to house look and we had seen in american indian art mm -hmm. um an ad from peter natan again i'm bringing up some of the old names in the business. So we stopped in. Joan was nursing our baby, our daughter, who was only a couple, two months old at that time. And we got to meet him. And uh, he was another character from the uh, old days. And I remember he was very, very um, strong. He says, only buy quality. That was his. The best you can afford. Buy the best you can afford. <laughs> that, and that's what he, he told us. It was good and, advice. <laughs> but we yeah. didn't always have the. Yeah, the, the means. Money, but, but yeah. Yeah, it's great advice, actually. Yeah. Yes. Buy one, not 20. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Unless all 20 are great. And then go ahead. <laughs> and do it. <laughs> it is true. The, the best always do better. Yeah. Um, and, you know, also, if you do decide to get rid of things and they're the best, they're easier to sell. They're more coveted. You had to work harder to get things that are more valuable. I mean, they mean something to your to your to you because it's if you have to push the envelope. I tell people if you have to if you lose sleep on whether you can buy this or not, that means it's probably you should be buying it because it's one of those that really mm -hmm. you're pushing the limit, and it's mm -hmm. good to push the limit. You're I mean more than likely you're going to be happy in the long run. And not forget money or whatever. It's just great things are and rare things are, are yeah. hard. To see. And I'm sure. You've had the same experience. You get something that's really wonderful that you've bought and it's expensive and you probably can't keep it just because it's so expensive. You need to sell it, but you appreciate it at that moment going, this is special. This is expensive. This is maybe one of one. I'm, I'll never have anything like this again. And you enjoy that for that moment. At least I do. I don't know. Do you have find that no, same we, experience? We've had that experience yeah. with, with the fantastic Serape, but it got just too precious for us we were worried about damage or loss or fire. A big just, responsibility. A big, a big, but it was fantastic piece. I mean, it was. Well, yeah. that's right. There is a responsibility. And again, take yeah. away the money. There's a responsibility right. because you have this rare object of right. that is, you know, that took immense amount of time and maybe have great artistic merit. And you want to, you know, you, you don't want anything to happen with that. Sure. Right. You know, Right. But, you know, we put it all together. It has been a ball. Yeah. I mean, if I can say anything yeah. that Joan and I have enjoyed the characters, good, <laughs> some bad. Um, we've enjoyed the, the, the surge. We've enjoyed the learning. We've, mm -hmm. we've seen in American Indian art and European museums and places you don't expect it. Um, it you know, I wouldn't w wouldn't give up what we started collecting uh, for anything. I mean, I, I, I like, uh, we, we, we enjoy right. it together. I mean, we really, we can walk around the show separately and we'll both be running after each other to find it because we want to buy the same piece. I mean, okay. it happens all the time. <laughs> so that's a good thing, yeah. you know? And uh, so, you know, in that regard, I think yeah, it's, it, it's enriched our life. If right. I was just going to the lab every day, I, I got a lot of pleasure out of my genetic research. Definitely. I think it's going to lead to some human um, the treatments. Uh, I'm excited and, and, and uh, look forward to that. But I think without the art dealing and without yeah. everything that goes along with it, the people, the material, mm -hmm. the learning, I wouldn't have half the life that I, yeah. and then Joan yeah. and I feel the same way. Yeah. And I would, I would propose that getting Jimmy K over to Berlin to feed the, the mass was just as important as the genetic stuff. Well, for him, it sure was. Uh, it was a treat. I mean, it was a thing you'll never forget. Yeah, it, it was important to him. It was important to oh, his yeah. culture. You know, it, those things have real merit too. You know, yeah. so yeah. doing yeah. those kind of things have just as, in my opinion, have as just a, as much merit as the other. And we can do those things in our business. We have the capability. Yeah. I'm sure you both have given many great objects to different museums and things for different shows and fundraising and all this kind of thing. And, uh, you know, that's kind of comes with it. That's the joy and the beauty of dealing in native American arts is though we might specialize more in the early antiquities, we get to know the people living people and living, yeah. you know, silversmiths, yeah. Tina Carvers and yeah. you know, all that, you know, so. No, there, are, there are a lot of very good, I mean, for medicine coming. So, Raymond, there's another funny story with Raymond Sequaptua. Joan had wanted a, a pin, a right of pin. Yeah, he doesn't and make he doesn't make pins. So when we were in India Market, Joan said, Well, if you ever make a pin, you can I'd like to see it or have a chance to buy it. Well, you you know he's bothered by dealers wanting to buy his material. And you know, we'll never get it. So one day we're living on South Street in Philly, a bazillion people walk by, and we get home. And here is sitting right on our step because it wouldn't fit in the mailbox was a box. You know, a zillion <laughs> people had walked by and here was this fantastic. So we had come in, it was from Raymond. He, did, he didn't forget. And he sent it to us and said, if you don't like it, send it back. And of course we sent him a check yeah. instead of sending it back. But in fact, that it just would, 
you know, that it wasn't taken, that it was just sitting on our step that uh -huh. walks by and it was there. I don't know how long it was there, but. And he had never yeah. even told you it was coming too. That's no, the he never told us it was coming. Yeah. We, you know, what's this box? You know, it was from Raymond, you know, sent from, you know, third Mesa or something, you know, I, uh -huh. I had a laugh, but you know, all these things add up to the stories, you know, that, that we tell ourselves and laugh about. What was that? That was crazy. You know? and, uh, well, it's clear that you've both lived a wonderful life and surrounded yourself with art and uh, culture and continue to do so and, you know, enriched not only your own lives, but I think others, people that meet you. I mean, all the things you've done, Joan, from buying and selling and, and curating to David to all your textiles that you do the uh, dye analysis on. That's all, you know, you're, you're a power couple. I'll, I'll say that. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> You know, there's going to be a show I, uh, at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia of their collection of pottery, jewelry, and textiles on February 20th. It opens. Uh, I 20, just, 22. 22. I just did the, I mean, not just, a couple of months ago, I did the dye testing on 33 samples. And uh, I, 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 they don't have a lot on display blanket-wise or textile-wise, but uh, there may be some in the the bee closet that's out in uh, where Barnes had a farm out in Chester County. Maybe some, I asked, they said some came out of there. So we've never seen those. So it's going to be interesting uh, to. Um, and there's great jewelry. Yeah, I, I know they have, they have these great pieces of jewelry intermixed with pots, intermixed with oh, yeah. impressions, exactly. paintings. And yep. <laughs> yep. That's right. Yeah, yep. you, you just put that squash blossom next to a <laughs> Van Gogh. It goes perfectly. Yeah. No, it it actually does. I think. <laughs> I personally do. I think he was way ahead of his time, and that's why he insisted on it being that way for the rest of you know yep. when when he donated everything to the city of Philadelphia. You can't change anything. Well, he didn't actually. You know, he didn't do that. The city. He, well, they he took was a it, bit of a, he was a bit of a pain in the ass. Yeah, as everyone knows. Mm -hmm. But he, he um, you know, he had his museum out in Marion outside the city. And then when he, you know how he got, he died? Yeah. Uh, uh, no, I don't know how he died. Well, he was an arrogant son of a gun. And he didn't think that he had to stop for stop signs or red lights. And he was hit by a truck in 1950 and killed. Oh. And so that, that, that teaches you, you better stop for red light. And stop signs. Well, his collection was in his home, which had very limited hours in a residential area. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, right. Like Tuesday when the moon was full. Yeah, it was but very we used difficult. We go there we, many times. Yeah. We went there when it was out there. Yeah. And it was a, really a unique grounds. Yeah, yeah. And we would take visitors who yeah. came. And then they moved it into the city. Um, but every room had to be done to the millimeter in terms of the hanging things the same way they were right. in Marion. The outside of the museums were very different. But, um, you know, but when they moved over, that's when they did the tour. He couldn't let anything be shown, photographed, lent. He had all these restrictions right. to, yeah. to his collection. And he, um, he unfortunately, well, they had to break all his will to move it into the city. Yeah. And he did not like anything that was related to museum curators or anyone of power. If you were a, a coal miner or worked in Bethlehem Steel, you could make an appointment and come in any time. If you were the curator of the Denmark Museum, you were persona non grata. <laughs> and he said, because they made fun of, why are you hanging a Horace Pippin folk painting next to a Van Gogh, next to a Picasso? And he said, why don't you just go to hell? <laughs> I do what I want. Yeah, well, I, I get that. I actually think I they, get it. And I actually think they look really wonderful when you do those kind of things, quite frankly. No, I, so do I. I mean, that's our collection, but uh, I think that he was a, um, he was a curmudgeon and he used to sit there like leaning back with some pictures of him leaning back on a chair and he's got his disciples in front of him. The one thing that, that, that ended up that it's not quite true. He rotated things every couple months. So mm. it wasn't like he did it once and he never changed it. Mm. He did keep changing it. It's just that when he died, that was the way mm. That's what stayed. we end up seeing, that and that's the I way stayed. it stayed. He, he was not set that it had to be this way. But, you know, yeah, it was one of the most amazing collections of impressions. Have you been there? I've never been there. No. Oh. But I've that's seen pictures, yeah. and I actually have my nephew, Richard, who's hopefully... I'm waiting for him to call me. Okay, well, Richard, you're gonna, I'll make him listen to this podcast. I talked to him the other day. He, yeah, <laughs> and he sent me. He went and sent me a bunch more pictures of. Oh, he did. Yeah, 
because it's it's one of the big ones on my list. But for years, you know, you couldn't really you had to make a special. Oh yeah, it was very different. Now and, it's open. We're yeah, members, right. but it's um yeah, it it, uh, it you know it, it's nice. They have rotating shows. We were there a couple months ago with De Kooning and um, Sautine. Sautine. Sautine, yeah. I like very much. That was in a rotating gallery you should mm -hmm. plan to come when they have the native show next year yeah that's not that's the time to come combine it yeah, and we'll see the museum yeah. and the show and us <laughs> <laughs> i will do that <laughs> you can even walk to our house yeah and i can go see my wonderful nephew as well yeah. right right well, but it's I think you it's know. Right. All right. Well, unless you have anything else that we need to add, has it been uh, fun for I get me? a million stories, no, but that's stop. okay. Let's let's <laughs> you know, just stop. Hey, we got time. This is a long format. I don't care. No, 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 no. So, I think we, no. we the other night we were watching Mike Bradford and uh, your I, interview, your interview with Mike Bradford, and um, and when I told my our daughter Kara, she says, "Oh, and I used to play with Sammy, Mike's daughter, when they were all Ari Maslow." Right. And, and Sammy Bradford and Kira Wenger, they were all, would, they were, when we were doing shows, they were playing around together, you know. Yeah. Little yeah. children now, and they're in their 40s now. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. My daughter's 50. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hate to say uh -huh. that. Does she have interest in this material? She appreciates it, but she doesn't, mm, it's not a collection, you know. It's not her thing. Not yeah. her thing. Yeah. Yeah. I she does appreciate She understands it and appreciates it. Oh, I'm sure she does. And she yeah. has probably yeah. great memories. Yeah, sure. All right, kids. Joan, <laughs> David, thank you so okay. much. We're the kids now, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, you, nice you, to talk to you. It's interesting, you know, you really have been in the business about as long as anyone that I've interviewed, quite frankly. Really? Yeah. Well, Don that. Bennett's first show, you know, yeah. I remember doing that at the Hilton, you know. It's, yeah. it was, I mean, it's a long time. Yeah, it's hard ago. to believe, but I guess so. It's over a half a century. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So there you have it. It's 78. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. Uh huh. All right. Don't worry. Right. Well, thank you for taking the time and uh, we'll right. be in, we'll be in contact. Okay. All right. All right. Thank, Mark. You, Mark. thank you, Mark. All right. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.